This week on The Communicators, Senator Amy Klobuchar of the Senate Commerce Committee on the political debate between the Senate and the House over the transition to digital television. Joining us this week on The Communicator, Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, who also serves on the Senate uh, Commerce Committee. Welcome. Thank you, Pedro. It's great to be on. And this is your second time back with it us. It is. We were talking cell phones last time, so well, it's great to be on. And joining us this time in the conversation, Amy McLean of Cable Facts. She serves as their editor-in-chief. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. Clen Senator Klobuchar, before we talk the details, could you talk a little bit, I guess, your perception of the politics that's been behind the back and forth of DTV over the last sure. couple of weeks as it shifts from body to body and, you know, twist to twist. What's the politics behind it? Well, you know, this all started out, and I think there's a lot of good things happening, at least in the Senate. It's been very bipartisan. Uh, what happened was people were really proceeding along with this digital TV transition. Everyone wants it to happen. There's some real benefits to it with the multiple channels and the availability of spectrum for law enforcement that'll be uh, made available after this transition to digital. So, but what happened was it was very clear to members of Congress that not enough work was being done by the Bush administration in terms of planning when you compare it to, say, Great Britain. And here we are, we're a month or so out, and we find out that they run out of coupons. Well, a lot of people in my state, 21 percent of the households in Minnesota, similar to around the country, have rabbit ear TVs. A lot of them hadn't gotten their coupons yet. Three million people were on a waiting list for these coupons. So what we decided after looking at this and talking to the Obama administration, the president himself called for a delay. We thought, let's give this new administration some time to fix the problems of the old, at least make this coupons available. And so we picked the date June 12th. I think it's common sense, and I have no doubt this is going to go through unanimously through the United States Senate, which is the body that always has someone putting a hold on things. Twice. Uh, the House mm -hmm. had some issues there. Uh, the Republicans in the House objected. However, I believe with the House rules, majority rules, we will get this through next week. It will be on the President's desk, and the date will be June 12th. So, as of last night, you took another vote. What changed between last night's vote and what happened initially with the legislation to, that you think is going to make that happen? Well, there were just some minor changes to the legislation uh, that, that uh, were changed to match up the House. Uh, Amy so. McLean. Um, you know, both you and uh, Senate Commerce Chairman Jay Rockefeller have made some criticisms, um, some statements criticizing the Bush administration for um, its handling of the transition. But the Commerce Committee, you know, is headed by Democrats going into 2009. Um, isn't there a role there that Congress has played as well? Well, Congress has played a role, I would say, to prod the administration to voice concerns. I was the first one that voiced concerns about the digital cliff and the digital footprint. The fact that one of the things coming out of Wilmington that we learned, well, they have a fairly low rate of people with uh, the uh, rabbit ear, the old TVs. One of the things we learned that are some problems aside from just the coupons, and that is that some of the antennas don't pick up signals. Uh, that means you go off the digital cliff or that there's problems with some households that the stations with the digital footprint they'll only get some stations and not another. I think more than the coupons, uh, we needed some time to look at those issues. And I got to tell you, I, I said to FCC Chairman Martin, I said, have you ever been on top of a roof in Minnesota in February to fix your antenna? We welcome you to come. I think some of these issues may involve different antennas, changes, and doing that in the summer is a lot smarter. And while I wasn't here when this date was picked in February, I don't think I'd pick a month after a new administration comes in to do this transition. I think it made sense. We were able to do some things uh, with the broadcasters to allow those areas that are already switched over to digital, Hawaii, the Wilmington area, that they didn't have to broadcast on analog anymore. We were able to work some things out for the cell phone carriers. I think there's been little, um, there's been objection, but it hasn't been uh, widespread but it's, I think people know the best thing is to get this right and it's the best thing for everyone. Well how is four more months is that really enough time to solve? I mean some people have called this a potential train wreck. I mean that sounds that sounds scary. <laughs> well the, the major problem here was the coupons and we know so far the transitions uh, in Hawaii and in Wilmington North Carolina actually went fairly well. There were some problems as I mentioned uh, with the Wilmington transition just in terms of what we found out about people's antennas. Uh, however, one of the things we learned is that a lot of people waited till the last week. Even though they were aware of the transition, they'd seen the ads, they knew what was going on, they didn't go get their coupons or their converter boxes till the last week. 
Well, here we have a situation where suddenly we're out of coupons. And we had told the American people, you know, this isn't going to cost you a lot. This is, you didn't buy this, and so we're giving you these coupons. They're out of coupons. One of the things we're doing with the economic recovery plan is to put funding in there uh, for these coupons so that people can get these coupons again, they can get the converter boxes. None of that would have happened so quickly in those last three weeks. Uh, so this gives us until June 12th to at least make sure those coupons and the converter boxes are available uh, to you know, the six million people uh, that still haven't done anything about this. So essentially, if people waited to the last minute, e even though they didn't get coupons and there was money run out, but if they waited to the last minute, what's to say that they're not going to do the same in, in, in four months? Oh, I think people will, but you've got to have the coupons available. And the way it was going now, there were literally no coupons available. And so we needed to get that funding into the program, and we needed to make those coupons and converter boxes available. So by expanding into June 12th, I think if they hadn't run out of funding in that program, most likely it would have happened despite some of these other things that I said. But clearly there was a problem that they hadn't planned ahead and they reached the cap on the funding, and never came in ahead. And so I, I don't know how it all happened. All I know is I don't think that the American public should suffer. And we all know this is more about just getting, you know, being able to watch. I was going to say Wheel of Fortune, but I'll say C-SPAN. <laughs> uh, this is more uh, than just uh, being able to watch TV for fun. Uh, this is also about people getting their weather. Minnesota's a huge tornado, ice storm state. People get their weather, they get their information that they need for their own safety on TV. And so the more we can do to make this go smoothly for people, the better off we'll be. Uh, Representative Barton was on the program mm -hmm. last week. He said that he had legislation that he worked on that could solve at least the funding issues. He could find money, get the funds. Cliff Stearns today in the Washington Times said that you can. Ex there's enough money there to express those coupons out first class. You can go ahead, provide the coupons, not have to worry about changing the date. Mm -hmm. Does that work in your Again, mind? Again, there are three million people on the waiting list. And if they really think in these last two weeks that are left that we're going to be able to take care of all those people on the waiting list and find them... I just, I don't, I don't think it's worth inconveniencing all those people. I, I just don't. And I think if we can give us until June 12th, we know there's still going to be problems. We saw it in Wilmington. We know it's not going to be perfect, but it'll give this new administration some time to get this done right and to get some education out there for people. And again, I think the broadcasters, people have been getting out, they've setting up the call centers. We've learned a lot in the last year. I've never been one uh, as much as some people to point fingers and lay blame. I just think everyone knew we had a problem when the coupons ran out. You mentioned the folks in Minnesota and doing mm -hmm. research for this. I came across the editorial. It was in the Albert Lee Tribune. Yes, you found the one editorial that went the other way. A lot of our newspapers have said delay. Fair but enough, but here's, here's what the Albert Lee said. Just, just so I can say, it, they uh, address you specifically along with the, the representative. Uh, they said no matter how far this country puts off the switch, there will be people who are not ready for it. Let's go ahead, let's get it accomplished. If some people are without their aerial TV receptive, what harm can done, be done by that? they end up by saying it's just television. Mm -hmm. It's not just television, though, to a lot of senior citizens in Minnesota who watch the weather to see what they should do the next day, if they should go out in the morning. I know this week in uh, the state of Virginia, where we had the little ice storm, my husband and I were glued to the news to see what my daughter's school was going to be closed the next day. Uh, these are things people get information from TV. Uh, we're, we're living at a time where people want to know exactly what's going on in the world around them with all these changes and people losing jobs. I, I, I just think it's pretty... Um, unfair to sort of sit above and say, well, my TV works because I've got cable, but, you know, sorry, you know, 20% of you might be in trouble. If we can just get those numbers down as far as possible so we inconvenience less people by doing this by June 12th. And again, I've been a big proponent of this. I think it offers huge advantage. I have not been saying blaming everyone mm -hmm. for this. It would have been nice if it had been more organized on the administration's part. But it's time to move on and get it done and get it done as well as we can. And the only reason I, I picked this one is because I imagine Albert Lee's more rural than or it's not. In a, it's in a rural area. And actually, that part of the state, when you look at where we have most of our uh, old-fashioned TV sets uh, tend to be, that part of the state's down around 10 to 15 percent, but if you go up to Duluth, Minnesota, it's up at 22, 23 percent, mm -hmm. uh, because some of the most rural areas have to use satellite, uh, so they don't use as many of the rabbit eyes, rabbit ears. You go to Minneapolis, St. Paul, 21 percent, mm -hmm. so it just depends. It's, it's towns that are larger in population, but they can be in rural areas that are having the most trouble. Mm -hmm. Do you have an indication, um, if the data is extended, are the consumer electronic makers 
ready with boxes to, to extend past that period? I mean, I'm, I'm at, they have production periods that they have set up around February. No, I know there were some problems early on, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, that that will be fine. Best Buy is located in Minnesota. I've worked very closely with them. Of course, like all the other uh, uh, retailers and, and the broadcasters, they would have preferred that this happen in February, but they understood. You know, there's issues for them. They've got inventory uh, that they won't go out as quickly. They had advertising and materials printed up. Uh, but I think they understand that the most important thing is to do this right. So hopefully even these extra four months will give some more time if there is an issue of shortage. I hadn't heard that uh, for the last few weeks because we're out of coupons. I guess the other question I have is just there's been so much concern about customer confusion. Are we adding more confusion by saying, oh, wait, 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 we were just kidding about this February 17th. You, you now have a few more months. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think people understand. For one thing, the other thing going on here is we're in this economic crisis. And it's just, for some people who just lost their job, this might be, not be the number one thing. And so they applied for this coupon, and then suddenly it's not available, and then they don't know what to do. So again, I think given that um, we have this change in administration, given that we know there's a problem past administration with making the coupons available and given that people are in tough times right now giving them a few more months it's just a change of a date it doesn't change the way the program's being administered it doesn't change how you do the coupons and you use them to get the converter boxes the legislation uh, does very little except to say let's change that date to June 12th. I know it's in the house but will any what do you think is going to happen next week when this hits house rules and we'll be able to do it before Democrats leave on their retreat next week? I believe that we will and, uh, and again the administration has been strongly behind this. The president actually was willing to take a lead on it uh, and you have the fact that you have uh, the House um, has little different situations in the Senate. I find it interesting again Senate was unanimous. Not one person objected. Not one person on the Senate Commerce Committee who had sat through all those hearings objected to extending to June 12th. We know there's an issue and I think the House uh, where a majority tends to rule more will be able to get this done. Uh, you mentioned the president, and so if we could change gears just a bit, the president this week, uh, at least in the House, found the House stimulus uh, mm -hmm. package patch. Mm -hmm. Within that, some indications or at least some money for broadband. Talk a little bit about the specifics of money and what does it really mean, on the larger sense, what does it mean that the president's taking the lead as far as broadband issues? Well, uh, as someone who cares a lot about this issue, uh, we've been working on it on the Commerce Committee. I've got a state that's like 44th out of 50 in terms of the speed of broadband, yet we have, you know, 10, 12, Fortune 500 companies in my state, um, I think this has got to be a priority. And I love that the president has been willing to make something that has tended to be more uh, techy uh, as a priority. This is a president that wants to keep his Blackberry. Uh, this is a president that was sitting in Hawaii when the lights went out uh, there. He knows we've got to do things about the grid and we've got to get uh, our internet system going. I look back to the 1930s when President Roosevelt knew that only 12 percent of farms had electricity. In 1935 he said let's do rural electrification. By 1949 we were at 75 percent of those farms. Goes from 12 to 75 percent. And think of how it changed America. Same thing with this. So this is our Super highway. This is our uh, this is our uh, Eisenhower's highway system of the 50s. The internet is of it today. And what I think we need here is first of all to make sure the way we do this. And by the way, the Senate bill and we've worked hard on this has nine billion right now. Uh, the House bill has about six billion for internet service. Uh, to make sure that we don't just focus on unserved areas, we also focus on underserved areas, areas like in Minnesota where maybe they can get internet but it's incredibly slow or it's incredibly expensive because they have to have satellite. To make sure that there's grants for uh, communities that want to work with businesses. We've got an area in uh, Staples, near Staples, Minnesota, where a major hospital, it employs hundreds of people. They don't have good internet service. So they are forming a, a, a group with the hospital and with a provider and some of the uh, communities there. And this would provide grants to get this done. Uh, fiber to the homes. And so I think that this is a very smart way uh, for this administration to go. It's going to create jobs. I think the estimate is that for every percentage point of broadband penetration, it produces 300,000 new jobs. We went in the year 2000 from fourth among 30 nations uh, for broadband su subscribership to where we are now, which is 15th. And we find that's in eight years, we went down that far. Uh, we finally have a president who's willing to talk about it, willing to say it's not acceptable. If we want to compete with other countries uh, like India or Japan uh, that have 
uh, penetration rates uh, like they do and have been working on this as for a government policy, we're going to have to improve things. Because I personally would rather have those jobs go to Thief River Falls, Minnesota, or Lanesboro, Minnesota, or to Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, than have them go uh, out uh, to other countries. Um, going back to the underserved versus unserved, that mm -hmm. was um, a big debate in the House Commerce Committee. Yes. Um, my understanding is the bill gives 75 percent of those grants to, of the funding to underserved areas, thus leaving 25 percent to unserved areas. So there's concern that areas with no broadband whatsoever would be getting less than whatever underserved is going to end mm -hmm. up meaning. Mm -hmm. so what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I want to look at what the percentages of unserved. I think there's acknowledgement, though, if we just went to unserved areas, we really wouldn't be getting us where we need to get. Uh, Park Rapids, Minnesota, there's a line for the library to use the terminals for people to find jobs because just outside of town, they can hardly get any internet service. Uh, law enforcement people talking about their problems with uh, getting internet service. Uh, this is a real issue. Uh, and, and these aren't just tiny little towns. These are some sizable communities out in rural America. Uh, so I think it's good that you do unserved as well as underserved. I know there's differences between the two bills right now, the House splitting the money uh, between the Department of Agriculture, Commerce Department, the Senate bill puts the money through Commerce but requires that 50 percent of it be spent uh, in rural areas. I think that's going to be an interesting negotiation point. Uh, but there will be uh, the, the basic point here is that people have acknowledged, which was important to me, that it is unserved. We want to do those. We have those in our state, but it's also underserved. We'll see how the percentages work out. Oh, and one of the issues that was brought up when talking about underserved is just what it means. There's been some controversy with the RUS program that goes mm -hmm. through the Department of Agriculture that, mm -hmm. you know, some, some towns may have two providers or, or more, and then they're getting, companies are coming in and getting grants to provide broadband service when a town may already have a lot. Right, and I think that the, the discretion having commerce or whatever body is going to be uh, in charge of this program, it'll be important to look at these. That's why there are going to be applications for grants. Congress isn't going to be like cherry picking which areas they want to do it in. I've just seen some real successes where we had these partnerships. We had, we've had some issues in Minnesota where maybe a town on its own decided to do it, and it's a very scary thing to do. Uh, if you're not partnering with experts and you don't have people involved that have done this before. So this idea, at least in the Senate bill, that acknowledges that you're going to have these private-public partnerships, I think is a smart way to go. Uh, within the legislation, how does it address issues of open access and net neutrality? Because bro providers are concerned in finally in, in kind of formalize that, formalizing that in the legislation, they're going to be concerned about how they affect their business models as far as net neutrality is, is concerned. Exactly, and the Senate bill is very clear on this. House bill has some provisions, but the Senate bill is very clear that if you're going to be taking this public money for this, you got to make sure uh, that it's open, that the public's able to access this, and I think that's a very good thing. Uh, we, as we go into this entire economic recovery package, we've got to be looking out for the people of this country and not just the people getting the money. And so I think that's one thing we've learned from how some of the, um, the, uh, the, the economic stabilization funds were used on Wall Street. Uh, and so part of this uh, is to make sure that there's open public access, and that's part of the requirements in the United States Senate bill. So could a large company access this money as well as small firms? Again, I think the, the details will be worked out. One, we, we just got this bill out of the committee, so it's heading to the floor. There's going to be more details worked out in Commerce Committee and the Conference Committee between the two houses. And then you also have uh, the administration. I think ultimately we'll have some power to determine the details. One of the ideas here with the Economic Recovery Plan is that Congress isn't going to micromanage every detail of this. Just like we didn't do earmarks in this bill, which I thought would be not where we wanted to go, uh, we're not going to be micromanaging every detail of, of how these grant, this grant program will be designed because we want to see speed and we want to see the Commerce Department or whatever agency handles this being able to do this as quickly as possible. Let me turn it around just a bit then. Say okay. if I'm a large cable provider yeah. or if I, I provide access, should I get access to that money rather than a small rural facility that maybe could do a better job in a rural community? I think, again, and I I personally have biased in terms of seeing that our small rural, rural providers have been able to do a better job with the Internet in Minnesota. I, I think that those, those things will be worked out. The key thing will be to make sure that however it's done, that it gets out to the people so we're actually building this out. Mm -hmm.
Um, so I know last month, I believe, you convened a broadband uh, roundtable in your mm -hmm. state. You've done your research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are there any takeaways from that that are incorporated into the bill that you feel like? Well, yes. And uh, what came out of that for me, having I went to 22 counties in our, our state and talked about this as well as the energy jobs and infrastructure, uh, was this underserved idea. Uh, was the fact that, yes, some of our communities can get access, uh, but there are enormous problems with that access. One person told the story about how it was something like six, seven hundred dollars a month if they did the satellite, which went faster, uh, versus these really slow line connections uh, that made it very difficult for them to do certain things off the internet. Uh, stories about how uh, school districts wanted to be able to use the internet more with their students, especially in rural areas where people are live far away, go great distances, and they couldn't do it because maybe half the school wasn't even able to have access even if they had the computer. Uh, stories, as I mentioned, of law enforcement having issues uh, because they couldn't access it. A hospital, major hospital, couldn't access it. It really is kind of shocking. And then, as pointed out, you go to some areas where they happen to have a rural telephone company who was forward thinking, and there's some, uh, obviously, some provisions in how the Universal Service Fund um, uh, creates incentives that helps this. But some small companies do it, some small companies don't. You're in a small company area that is very remote yet they had something like 70 percent internet access with high-speed internet just because they had decided they they did the lines at the same time and one of the things I actually want to work on I'm also on the Environment and Public Works Committee as we do this transportation bill to look at uh, how we can have incentives for when they're digging up roads and doing things to allow cable and to allow uh, internet providers, telephone lines, to lay their lines at the same time to save money, how we create incentives for government to allow that to happen at the same time. I've talked to Senator Warner, who's, act, as you know, well acquainted with these issues because of his background, Mark Warner, and I think we'll be working together on that to do everything we can to make that easier as we go forward. We have about a, a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Changes at the FCC. Michael Copps is the acting chairman. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the first few days of his tenure? And as a, as a member of the committee that oversees these kind of issues, what do you want to see from a future FCC under the Obama administration? Well, I'm, I'm excited Chairman Cops in there on an interim basis. He's uh, excellent and uh, very smart, knows these issues. I think that's good. Um, and I think the Obama administration, starting with the president himself, uh, is going to be much more focused on these issues. I thought uh, that there were some difficulties with Chairman Martin. Uh, as we know, he was sort of focused on certain issues and certain things. As it didn't seem to me there was as much of the global look at seeing this as, um, as economic development, as a tool for economic development. Again, uh, we were able to work with him on, on, on some issues well, but to see this all as this can generate jobs, uh, this can move our country forward, and let's look at telecommunications, cable policy, broadband policy as a whole. Uh, and I thought that was missing from, and not necessarily just Chairman Martin, but this administration as a whole, the Bush administration. You're going to have a new administration, very forward thinking, wants to think of this as a tool of economic development, wants to get this out there to people. A whole campaign that ran on the internet, uh, that ran in a very different way. I think for Barack Obama to turn his back on Broadband and internet makes no sense to me, and you haven't heard it. He is making a priority. He's the first president who's made, talked about it in his first few weeks on the job. I think it's very good. we got time for one more question. Um, do you expect the committee to have um, more, less, about the same um, oversight? Uh, I think the uh, I, I, you know. I think it's it's going to be different because I think you're going to see an administration uh, that's going to be moving things and and doing things in conjunction with not just the FCC but the Commerce Department um, that moves things in the area of technology. So I think we'll have a bigger role because I think there'll be more legislation. Uh, oversight's always very important. We'll continue that. Uh, the Commerce Committee had to deal with some big issues last year with the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, and the toys issue. Uh, we had to deal with. Uh, the cell phone issue, I'd still like to see more work done in that area. Chairman Rockefeller has pledged to be uh, very active in this area. Uh, we have a very strong uh, committee, I would say, with, uh, you know, I don't want to start naming names because I'll get in trouble because I'll forget <laughs> someone. I'm excited about the new members, uh, Tom Udall and Mark Warner, Warner and Mark Begich. Uh, Claire and I were the uh, new people on the block last time, and we're still on there, Claire McCaskill. Uh, and, you know, you have people who have been very active, Maria Cantwell from a business background. Um, on that committee. So I think that, uh, I think when Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who's uh, very knowledgeable on the airline industry, you're going to see us moving on uh, FAA 
uh, reauthorization, something the administration is also very interested in. I'd like to do more on, on rail uh, with some of our captive customers. I just think you're going to see a invigorated committee and certainly uh, our chairman, Senator Inouye, going on to great things as head of appropriations uh, and uh, ranking member Stevens had been together a long time, did a good job. Things were very bipartisan on that committee. You'll continue to see that, I would predict. Uh, but we're just going to get a lot of new ideas and new action from the administration, and I think that'll be a lot of fun and good for the country. A member of the Senate Commerce Committee, Senator Amy Klobuchar, our guest this week on The Communicators. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And, Great to be on. And uh, to Amy McLean, thank you. Thank you. Before we leave the program, one more perspective on the transfer to digital television, this time from someone who watches it uh, from the industry's point of view, Dan Modisette is the general manager of WLBT in Jackson, uh, Mississippi. Uh, Mr. Mata said, as you watch the back and forth between the Senate and the House over this bill, what is the top of your concerns about whether or not we're changing over in February? Well, I think probably the, the top thing in our minds is, as operators from a station perspective is the added expense at a time when the economy is uh, in advertising has definitely declined. And most television stations are UHF, and if you run another four months, which is the projected uh, time period between February and June, that'll cost stations between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a month, or sixty to eighty thousand dollars, which would mean probably layoffs in, a, in, in an industry that's already faced a lot of layoffs. As far as investment, because of this transfer, uh, the total amount, how much have you invested in this? Uh, total digital is probably somewhere around $4 million for and our station over the past several years. Now, we've had a long time to change our equipment out as, as equipment aged and we replaced it. We replaced it with digital-ready equipment. Now, for most stations, all they have to worry about is whether they're going to – is airing a, a digital signal. But in your case, as you told me before, this uh, transfer has another complication for you. It absolutely does. Uh, you can't just uh, say, well, I'm going to change on this date, because your channel may interfere with another channel in an adjacent market. In my case, I'm switching from my transitional channel of Channel 9 to a Channel 7. And um, there's another station in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, that's running an analog Channel 7. Well, I can't change until he changes or we'll interfere with each other. And this is multiplied all across the country. So it's, it's not as simple as, well, I'll just pick a date in either February 17th or June 12th or somewhere in between. Uh, it's just not that simple. We don't control that 100% at the station level. We have to work it out with you know, the interference agreements, and FCC, and all different type things. And I suppose you've been doing quite a bit of promotion as far as this channel change in itself, thinking the February date was going to stick. Well, part of the DTV transition um, requirements of television station, we run at least 16 spots a week, um, alerting viewers to the transition. We run crawls uh, constantly, for the, and it's been going on for 11 months. And, of course, what we, we've done such a good job that in the initial there was more demand for the boxes than were available for those people that were early, and their coupons expired before the manufacturers could supply them. And then if you ordered anything late, say, in November or December, the federal government had run out of money. So if you were an early adopter or you were kind of late on the end, uh, you don't have a coupon from the government. So there, there, it's been mishandled, and we had such a long time to plan for it, it should have never happened like this. As far as uh, the viewers of your, of your channel, do you think that most get the idea that this transfer is coming? I know that one of the things that have, has been mentioned over the week is confusion on the end of whether really people understand about the change or not. Yeah, I think there's a high degree of awareness. Um, there's 9% in our market, and that's 9 or 10% in most markets across the country that still watch over the air. And unfortunately, that 9 or 10 percent usually is those that are uh, in the lower economic uh, strata and also a lot of elderly people. And when you talk about any technological change or having to hook up a converter box or anything like that, it's, you know, their eyes just glaze over, <laughs> you know, and unless they have somebody that can do it for them, it's, it's not easy to do. Uh, you know, I mean, how many VCRs are still blinking at 12 o'clock? 
across the country. Well, this is a, a, a tougher thing than hooking up a VCR. And then rescanning, you have to go through there and scan the channels. All this requires some degree of, you know, technical expertise. So it's it's not an easy transition. That's the reason we ask people to start so early so that they would make sure that they are ready. Dan Modisette is the general manager of WLBT TV in Jackson, Mississippi. Thanks for your time. You bet. Thank you, Pedro. And that's it for the communicators this week. Thanks for watching.